We are concluding our series today, Set Free. And uh, aren't you glad that God's not done setting us free? Uh, we may be done with the series here, but God, uh, God, God is setting people free, continues to set people free. And, uh, and I've been excited. Has this series been rich? Have you, have you enjoyed this series? Have you learned from this series? Have you been squeezed? in this series. I know I have. I have as well. And, uh, and, and God is just so rich in his mercy and his, and his grace. And so we're going to continue. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to read the scripture we've been reading over the last several weeks. Hopefully you've got it memorized by now. Let's read. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Father, I thank you for your word, and I thank you that it brings life to those who will receive it. I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open today. I pray, Lord, that you would do something special today in the hearts of those who are hearing the words that come across. Lord, I pray anything of me would fall to the ground, but everything that's of you would stick for eternity. We love you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So uh, as I said before, we're talking about self-control. And, uh, you know... Have you ever had a list of goals or a list of items on a, on a list that you hope to achieve and, and want, to, want to graduate to, and you've got all of these things, but you never quite get to number 10, 11, 12, 13. You never get to those things at the very bottom of the list. You know, for me, when I, when I, when I read the, the fruit of the Spirit and I see that list of the fruit, you know, we get we, the love and joy and, ooh, peace, you know, and, oh, patience. Oh, oh, what about love, and then joy, and then, oh, peace, and patience, and, con- well, patience, and then, and then love, and joy, and, you know, you start, you start to, to go, and as, as I read, as I, as I read the fruit of the Spirit, I begin to realize that I just kind of, when you get to those last few, I just kind of skim on by and continue reading, because I'm so working on those, on those front few, you know, and, and, and looking and examining those, those, those front few, so self-control can kind of just get lost on your, on your mental capacity as you're, as you're reading or your spiritual capacity, if you will, as you're reading right along. But self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. And we need self-control. Can you just tell your neighbor, I'm so glad you're here today. And just say, would you please listen to the message today? Self-control is one of those things that gets measured by people who are out of control. Yes? Self-control is kind of identified whenever you see somebody out of control. You don't know when somebody is exercising self-control. Control. You know, I don't know how many people were exercising self-control during the Alabama-Arkansas game yesterday, but I can tell you somebody who wasn't, Justin Bashirs. But you, but you, you know who, you know somebody might need a, a little dose of self-control, you know, if you, if you see them and you examine their life and they seem to be operating out of control, right? And so you look at this barometer, it's kind of like what I was talking about when we were talking about goodness. You know, we, we tend to measure good by bad, right? If we see bad, then we kind of know, well, what's the opposite there? We, we kind of know that this is, this is good. Well, well self-control uh, is, is similar to that in that when we see something or someone particularly someone who is out of control, we look at them and we say, well, that's a person that's out of control and they need self-control. Well, here's the interesting thing. We tend to see other people's out of control, but we don't see our own. We, we have a tendency to really be able to call out those that we say, hey, you're, you're, you're really, you, you really need to exercise some self-control here. Uh, but boy, we seem to be blind to when it's happening in our life. And aren't you glad to have brothers and sisters and spouses and mirrors and other things in your life to help call you out when you are out of control? Yes? 
It's kind of like that, uh, that thing Justin was talking about when he was talking about faithfulness. We have, a tendency to, uh, we have a tendency to look at people and call out their unfaithfulness more than we do when they're faithful. And so when, when we look at people, you know, it really takes an intimate connection and relationship with people to be able to say, I can tell this person is exercising self-control. I can tell that this person really their flesh, because I know them, they, they'd want to hit the roof about this particular thing, but they're not responding in that way, right? And you start to realize that that intimate connection, you start to realize it. If you are married in the house, you know when your spouse is operating outside of self-control, amen? And you also recognize when they have grown in that area, Amen. You recognize and we acknowledge when they've grown in that area. When I think of self-control, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is stuff that looks like this. Rage, anger. Anybody? Yes. You see self-control and you're just like, boy, if, if, if this type of thing happens, these people definitely need self-control. This is one of the bigger ones. The second one that I think about most is when, I, when I'm thinking about self-control and people who might need it is, is things dealing with addictions. Addictions. And you know there are a variety of different types of addictions out there. And so when I see addiction of every, any kind, I'm, I'm thinking, man, if they, if they had self-control, they wouldn't engage in, in those types of things. But these are, these are maybe the, the big, bolder ones. And sometimes we can, we can read that list and we can get to self-control and we can think, you know, I'm not really anger, angry or deal with rage and I'm really not addicted to anything that I can really put my finger on. So I've got this, this self-control thing down. But that's until you realize that there's a whole myriad of things that we need self-control over. Addiction and anger and rage are, are among those, but what about gossip? Lying. Pornography. Eating habits. Gluttony. Social media. Laziness. Overspending. Time management. The list goes on and on and on and on. The list goes on. All of us need self-control in our lives. All of us need this fruit in our lives in a variety of ways because when we are not plugged into the Lord, we have no choice but to be out of control. Our flesh desires to be completely out of control control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. That list that I show, show just now is a list of the fruit of the flesh. All of those things are fruit of the flesh. You do not have the power to control those things on your own. You do not have, I do not have the power to stop doing those things on my own. How many of you have attempted to stop doing something that you didn't want to do and you made a good shot at it, you were successful for a season, and then you ended up back in the same spot again? Anybody relate to that? Look around the room. And then you say, man, and you beat yourself up. And you say, man, I've got to do better. I've got to do better. And so you start again and you try something different and you walk a little bit. And guess what? You might be successful for a season. And then all of a sudden that thing rears its head again. And there you are finding yourself in the same spot you were years ago, weeks ago, months ago. Anybody? And so it's this cyclical pattern of things that happen in our, in our lives. And, and what I've come to understand when it comes to something like self-control is when we operate out of our flesh, when we try to, when we try to solve these issues and try to do these things in our own strength, we kind of look like this. Mm -hmm. 
That's what we actually look like when we try to control things ourselves with our own strength, by our flesh. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so we look at these things and we find ourselves in this cyclical pattern of coming back to the addiction or coming back to the anger or coming back to the lying or or any of those things on the list and the other things that are not listed. We find ourselves in this perpetual pattern that we can't get out of and we wonder what is wrong. We wonder what's going on with us. You know, if I am to plant an apple tree and this apple tree grows, this apple tree grows and I go out with clippers and I take a limb of that tree and I chop it off. That limb is no longer going to produce apples. That limb will no longer produce apples, but the tree is going to go through a cycle and eventually that next, that next season, the limb will grow back and what's going to happen? Apples are going to grow again, right? So what happens in our lives with these things that we have, we have issues with is we end up identifying them and we say, I don't want this a part of my life, Lord, anymore. I don't want these things. And it's like going to that apple tree. We go and we ask the Lord to give us the strength to cut it off of our lives. And then we go out to that tree and we cut it off and it's no longer there and it's dead. And we experience freedom for a season. And then when the next seasons, when the next season comes and the season changes, we find ourselves in the same spot again where that thing has grown back and it's still there. So what then? What are we to do with these things that continue to come back in our lives? I want to submit to you today that these issues here and the ones that are not listed here are not actually the issue. These are symptoms of the root. And I believe this morning, God wants to address some roots so that you can have self-control over some of the symptoms. I believe that we vastly underestimate the power of the seed. Seeds that are planted in our lives yield so many things And God wants to cultivate the soil of your life and begin to till out, prune away, and break up the things in your life that are not supposed to be there. But in order to do that, you're going to have to face some things that you don't want to face. It's really not about any of these things. What it's about is that we are rooted in brokenness. Everyone in this room is broken. You started out like this, and I don't mean when you were born. I'm talking about when you were conceived in God's mind as an idea, as a person. When he had the idea to create you, his creation and his thought of you was for you to be whole, was for you to be whole. But as you entered this this world, this broken world, Stuff happened to you and you begin to break. And as life continued, people came into your life who were also broken and they broke more things in your life. And they broke more things in your life. And as you encountered situations, you became more and more and more broken And God did not desire for you to be broken, nor does he desire for you to remain broken. You were created to be whole. These are the issues that we deal with in our brokenness. It's not really about the addiction. It's about the pain that brought me to the place of the addiction. It's not really about the gossip. It's about the insatiable desire to fit in that brought about the gossip. It's not about really about the lying. It's about not feeling safe enough with the person that you're lying to that you feel like you've got to paint a false picture to them. It's not really about the pornography. It's about a lack of understanding and a lack of intimacy. True intimacy. 
in your life. It's not really about social media and and the lack of self-control of posting on social media. What it's really about is your worth. If I get 102 likes, I feel pretty good for the next five minutes. We are so entrenched in our brokenness that we do not identify the things that actually will set us free from the things that we need self-control over. And so we're rooted in this brokenness and because we are moving so fast and because we are so scared, we do not evaluate the broken pieces so that God can put us back together again. You were never meant to be broken. You were created to be whole. You were created to be whole. All of us have that one thing. All of us have that one thing. That time when that person said something to me that I believed and the rest of my life was affected by it. That time when that parent was not there like I believed that they should have been for me. That time when that, when that tragic event happened in my past that I do not want to deal with because I'm scared about what I might see. These things in our past that we have experienced, that one thing that happened so long ago has had power over your life and causes you to do things that you do not want to do and go places that you do not want to go. And the trick of the enemy is to say your issue is the symptom. But God says, no, that's just the symptom. I want to address the root. Guys, we are broken. We are fractured. And God does not intend for us to stay that way. Have you ever built a puzzle? 100 piece, 1,000 piece, 5,000 piece puzzle? And you build the puzzle, you work all of that time, and you get to the end to discover that one piece is missing? One piece is missing. Now, you can go and get a piece of construction paper and try to fit that in there and draw on it and try to make it, but it doesn't quite fit, right? Doesn't quite fit. The only thing that will fit that hole was what was intended to go there in the first place. You were created to be whole. But in your brokenness, what we do is we try to put ourselves back together by saying, I'm just going to numb the pain. And if I numb the pain, I don't have to deal with the past. If I, if I can just, if I can just show everybody that, that I'm okay by smiling and acting a certain way, if I can just, you know, maybe, maybe if I can put on more makeup or if I can buy different clothes, if I can get more likes, then maybe they will like me because my dad never told me that he loved me. And we attempt to take all of these things and to rectify a broken state. I'm telling you guys, you will never become whole on your own. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God. Romans 10 tells us that we are to confess with our mouths Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts and then we will be saved. Now we got the believe in our hearts part. But there's this part that talks about confessing that Jesus is Lord. Jesus, for him to have lordship in our life, it means a surrender to everything else. The confession that he is to be Lord of my life is the identification of the things that I need him to take lordship of. And for him to take the lordship place. As I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that he will do it. And then I will be saved. But guys, we don't like 
What's under here? We're scared to pull this off. We have such fear. A few years ago, I took my daughter Hadassah on her first roller coaster. This was what she looked like on that roller coaster. <laughs> this was yesterday or the day before in Dollywood. Yes. Here's the point. You have to work through your fear before you can experience the joy of freedom. Yeah. You have to work through your fear before you can truly experience the joy of freedom. Yes, that one thing, it's there. And you go to God and you say, God, come on out, worship team. God, I don't, I don't want to look at it because I'm afraid of what I'm going to see. And God says, I know you can trust me. God, but you don't know what they did to me back then. And you don't know how much it hurt. He says, yes, I do. And I want to hold you as I take you through it. But God, that one thing, what will people think if that one thing is exposed? He says, what I have to say about you is so far superior than what anybody else says about you. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. The Bible tells us about some things that God hates. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, it says six things, seven that he detests. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And guys, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm guilty about, of most of those. But all of those are symptoms of a root issue. And the root issue of brokenness is not being dealt with because I'm scared, we're scared, that God is going to look at us and hate us like he hates these symptoms. But that's not what the scripture says. The Bible says in the book of Psalm chapter 51, he says, a broken and a contrite heart, God, you will not despise. A broken and a contrite heart, he will not despise. He may despise those things that we've done. He may hate those things that we've done in our lives as a symptom of a root issue. But he will not despise you. The reason he despites, despises those things is because it brings harm to your life and it severs the connection between you and him. He does not despise you. And you have not missed the mark so much that you are, his arm is too short to save. I don't know what it is that you brought in to this place today. I don't know the well with which you're drawing out of. But if you've got that one thing in your life that is stopping you from being completely whole, I believe that God today, there's this God who breathes stars. Remember we sang that song and it says a hundred billion failures fade away. You are not a failure in God's eyes. You are a new creature, a new creation. He is for you. He is not against you. But you've got to get to a place where you can recognize I'm broken and I need you, Lord. Lord. I need you, Lord. Because guys, when we get to the place where we address that one thing, if we can just have faith enough, if we can have the courage enough to trust the Lord and allow him to lift that off of us, he'll take it away. And not only will he make you whole, you will have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And not only are these the fruit of the Spirit, but these will be a fruit of a life that's been set free. You have been set free. So would you stand with me this morning? I would like to see some patterns be destroyed in the house today. I would like to see some brokenness mended in the house today. I would like to see those of you who keep struggling over and over and over again with the same thing in that same pattern, be willing to be confident enough and bold and courageous enough to come and say, God, I have to identify that the reason I'm in this spot is not because I'm such a bad person, but it's because I keep not addressing the main issue. Brokenness. He won't despise you. He wants you. And he'll take great care of your heart in the process. If you're going to pray with people, would you come forward? There's something really powerful about the altar space. The altar space is a place where you move and you come and you acknowledge this God. You step out physically and you make a declaration spiritually that, God, I need you. People are here because not because they're perfect. Everyone down here is broken too. But they know the pathway of being made whole. And they can pray with you and offer grace. The altar space is open. As we sing here, I invite you to come. If you just want to kneel in the altar, if you just want to spend some time with this God, let's deal with that one thing this morning.